Thank you. Thank you so much. To you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Lee, thank you for that amazing introduction. Please come with me wherever I speak. Uh, and also importantly for your extraordinary leadership in Minnesota. I'm working on how you say Minnesota. Uh, you are terrific. Cynthia, for your leadership, creating the Women's Funded Network and everyone who's here who supports it, just thank you for everything you do. There is no place I would rather be this morning than right here with you. So I owe you a debt of gratitude. So yesterday, as I boarded my plane for San Francisco from Washington, uh, and believe me, any opportunity to leave Washington these days is a good day, but as I boarded the plane, I confess to you, for reasons I can't explain, I was still hopeful that perhaps there would be a change in the decision to end DACA. And so when I got on board and I settled in my seat, I nervously started getting ready to access the Wi-Fi. And the pilot came on and he said, I have bad news. The Wi-Fi is not working. Well, I don't think I've gone six hours without Wi-Fi in 10 years. So I didn't know what to do. And so I'm sitting there perplexed, and I'm thinking, well, I'm not going to know what happened until I land. So what do I do? So I pulled out my remarks, and I thought, well, let me work on the speech. And then I started thinking about not so much what we had accomplished, but how we had accomplished it over the last 10 years. And you'll see a theme, as I tell you, the following stories of the people who actually made shit happen. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then I will conclude by explaining why that should be relevant to you. So the first story I will share with you uh, seems particularly poignant today. The first time I met with a group of dreamers was in 2010. They had walked from Florida to Washington, D.C. They were led by Gabby Pacheco, and their effort was called Trial, The Trail of Dreams. And I had to meet with them outside of the White House, because at that point in time, if they had come into the White House, they ran the risk of being arrested as they came through the gates, because they were not legal. They were undocumented. And so we met in the basement of a church, and they told me their stories. And I remember their stories of one in particular who was a teacher. And she said to me, what am I going to do if I can't teach? That's my life calling, is to teach. And when you think about that effort and how crushed they were when Congress did not vote to put in place a statutory authorization for DACA, did they give up? No, they did not give up. And so you fast forward, and a few days ago, somebody published a photo on uh, Twitter of a group of dreamers meeting in the Oval Office with President Obama. And I like the photograph because it zeroes in on one of the young people telling the story about what America meant to that person. And that's what each of them did. They talked about our country as their country, as the country they have only known, ever known. And many of them didn't find out that they weren't citizens until they applied for a job, or they applied to go to college, or a driver's license. And so what a shock it came to them that they were not American citizens. But I raised their effort just to say that if they had the courage and the tenacity to walk from Florida to withstand a bruising defeat in Congress, on the same day I might add that Congress did repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And so if you can imagine the emotions that were running between a victory and such a defeat, and to be able to talk to the President of the United States in the Oval Office, they're not giving up and we can't give up on them. We need you for that effort. Now, uh, it's hard to believe 10 years later, I'm still telling stories but from the first Obama campaign, but there's a woman in particular whose story I love to tell, and her name is Ashley Bai. I met Ashley in South Carolina, a state I think I had actually never been to before the presidential campaign. And the way our campaign worked is field organizers put together events, small events in local facilities. This one was in a library, and then they tell a story. And Ashley told the story of, at eight years old, her mother was diagnosed with cancer. And she was trying to figure out how to be helpful. And because her mother uh, had to withdraw in uh, lengthy treatment, she lost her job. And when she lost her job, she lost her health insurance. And so Ashley said, at the age of eight, she decided that the best way 
to help her family income was to convince her mother that she liked condiment sandwiches. Yeah, condiment sandwiches. Mustard sandwiches, ketchup sandwiches, mayonnaise sandwiches. And so every day when her mother said, well, what would you like for lunch? She'd say, I'd like, and then she'd name the sandwich. And she thought that that was how she could help her family. So she tells a story, and then she's, as a way of introduction, she said that because she knew President Obama lost his mom, that she hoped that he would fight for her mother's health insurance, just the way he would have cared about having it for his own mom. So we go around the room, and everyone tells a story. She asks them to explain to me why they were there and what I could say in my remarks that would address their concerns. So people talked about veterans' uh, benefits. They talked about economic development. They talked about education. And as we got about three-fourths of the way around the room, a young, one, young man said, I don't want you to talk about anything, because all I needed was to hear from Ashley. Because Ashley has been in our community for months now. And I know her, and I know her story about her mother. And I care about her. And therefore, if she believes in President Obama, I believe in him too. So I told this story to President Obama when we were on our way to Atlanta for him to speak at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, Martin Luther King's church. And he was having a hard time with the ending of his speech. And so when I told him the story about Ashley, he said, that's the ending. That's what this campaign, that's what our effort is all about. It's a young white woman from Texas who's working in South Carolina and an older black gentleman who lives in South Carolina finding a connection, finding a relationship and believing in each other. And she symbolizes the hopefulness that I have for our country. Next person, Buffy Wicks, who's one of your own from California, she ran our field operations in California at the age of 29. She developed a national strategy that we used both in 2008 and 2012, where we had the largest gender gap in the election in our nation's history. She, of course, joined my office because I picked the best and the brightest, something I do really relish doing. Um, but leaving, having her leave and go on to run this incredible effort here in California uh, makes her an extraordinary young person. Next person. You'll remember in the aftermath of the death of Michael Brown, we had uh, demonstrations in Ferguson and around the country. And President Obama decided to convene many of these young organizers. And a young woman named Brittany Packnett came to his office. Uh, she was running Teach for America in St. Louis. An incredible young woman, and she was so passionate that he asked her to join his task force on 21st century policing. She wasn't from law enforcement. She wasn't an academic. She wasn't a pastor who had had depth and breadth of experience consoling people. She was a young woman who cared desperately about developing strategies to make communities safer for people of color. And from there, she has become just a national figure and a national treasure. And it happened because she was willing to get involved. She was willing to say, it's not enough just to protest. I have to be a part of the solution and get involved. So you mentioned, Lee, that President Obama created the White House Council on Women and Girls. What an honor it was for me to chair it for all eight years. There are often times where people said to me, how did you last eight years? Where else would I have rather been than there? <laughs> right? The last day, they had to like, pull my fingers off the door. It wasn't until I saw them changing the furniture in the Oval Office that I thought I better skedazzle out of there. Uh, it was truly a passion. Well, so why? Because I had such an incredible team of young people from Avril Siegel, who now lives in California, Jordan Kaplan, who is a rock star, who many of you know, Kalisha DeSource, who was really the inspiration and a partner with so many of you when we launched our Prosperity Together initiative. They are the ones that made it work. People often say, well, why did he make this a priority? I would say it's because of how he was raised. And what I mean by that is a single mom who had to depend on food stamps for a portion of his childhood while she finished her education, living in the household with grandparents and seeing his grandmother hit a glass ceiling as she tried to progress up through the corporate ladder in her bank and seeing men leapfrog over her every single day and watching her come home with her soul crushed for why she couldn't get that much, des much deserving promotion. Then he's married to this extraordinary wife, you must admit, right? But most importantly, he has two girls. 
And his hope for them is that they can be whatever they want to be. And I do often say that uh, talent is ubiquitous, but opportunity is not. But I also believe you can't be what you can't see. And so our girls all around our country need to be able to have what the Obama girls and my daughter had, role models of people who are doing what they might dream to do so that it doesn't seem like such a stretch anymore. It isn't a dream, and I give our daughters credit for that. They may stand on our shoulders, but it is our job to allow them to spread their wings and to fly. So through the council, we made progress on a range of fronts that I am so proud to, um, to brag about, and it's everything from the basket of issues we call working families issues, and I give Leader Pelosi, your very own Leader Pelosi, credit for encouraging President Obama to talk about the fact that when women succeed, America succeeds, a true fact indeed. But we talked about affordable uh, childcare and workplace flexibility and paid leave and paid sick days. We're still the only developed country in the world that does not have a national paid leave policy. How on earth are we gonna be globally competitive if we don't provide paid leave? It's, the, it's ridiculous. So this whole basket of issues we determined are not women's issues anymore. These are family issues, working family issues. They're issues that are important to our economy. They're issues that are important if we want to be competitive, if we want to retain and attract the best talent we have. We launched the It's On Us campaign. I wish when my daughter went off to college, I had asked better questions. And I am just so fortunate that she didn't fall into the one in five women who are sexually assaulted while in college. One in five is an epidemic. It's an epidemic. And it came really home to me when a young woman who attended Amherst, my daughter's alma mater, introduced Vice President Biden. And she told a story about being raped her second week of school her freshman year by a man who lived down the hall. And so she said every day when she came out of her room and went into the hallway, she would look to see if he was in the hall. She describes her freshman year as like walking through pantomime. What did it take for a young woman, barely in her 20s, to stand up in front of a huge audience and on international television and talk about being raped? She never told anybody about the rape at the time. When she finally decided to report the young man was when he raped again. And that is so often the case because we think we did something wrong. We were somehow culpable. We somehow asked for it. Not recognizing that no means no and consent is absolutely essential. But the, this young woman, when she saw somebody else going through it, wanted to make sure it didn't happen to another person. She is a hero. She's another one of those heroes I want you to know about. Another important issue we took on was the implicit biases in our toys and entertainment industry. And I sure remember, as many of you in this room, moms may remember, or older sisters, taking my daughter through Walgreens, let's face it, to look for her costume for a Halloween parade. All of the boys' costumes are in one place. You know, they're fighting, and they've got swords and guns and whatever. And then the little princesses are in another aisle. Or our movies. And so we, through Sarah Hurwitz, who is a junior person on the First Lady staff, brought together the industry to really focus on what we could do to create movies much more like Martian or Wonder Woman, where you see these women in incredible positions again so that you can be what you can see. Criminal justice reform, and you touched on that too, Lee. What we do in our criminal justice system is, is inhumane to everybody, but particularly to women. And it's just recently that the atrocities, such as shackling while giving birth, uh, that women endure are coming to, to light. And I have visited girls' detention centers and seen young girls clearly on the path to the, to the criminal system. And I've seen that sexual assault to school, to prison pipeline that is a straight shot. And when you hear their stories, you can't imagine, well, what else could have happened to them? One in particular I met in Wichita. I was invited to Wichita by all people but the general counsel of Coke. Uh, Coke Industries. Yeah, you must be wondering, what on earth was I doing going there? Well, he partnered with us on criminal justice reform, and he wanted me to meet these young women of color who were a part of a deten uh, di diversion program. And these women told me stories of being raped as young children, of being abandoned. One woman told me the story of having come here from Haiti uh, with her parents. They abandoned her. 
She was adopted. She was abused. She was put up for adoption again. She was adopted. She was abused. She was put up for adoption a second time. And at the point I met her, she was li living in a group home. And she aspires to be a chemical engineer. And through this diversion program, she will be a chemical engineer. Those are the stories that give me strength. And so when I think about everything that we're doing through the consortium, and I, I gotta give you a shout out. Anna, stand up for a second. Just, come on, get up, come on. When we first met, my goodness, she came in my office like a ball on fire, right? And Lee, you were with her and a group of, of these incredible women who were heading foundations and she's like, we can do this. We can do this together. And anyone who knows her intensity, you know you have no choice but to do whatever she tells you <laughs> to do. And we did, and we did, and we're continuing to do that very important work, focusing on those issues that women and girls of color uniquely face, and whether it's, um, ex whether it's the school discipline that they endure, whether it's the juvenile justice system, whether it's their exclusion from STEM education, teenage pregnancy, economic security, the whole basket of issues that uniquely fall so heavily on women and girls of color, we are addressing together. And Lee uh, walked you through many of the uh, commitments that we have from the foundations for which we're so proud. Out of that effort, I met the final young person I want to talk to you about, Marley Diaz. I don't know how many of you know Marley. Anybody know Marley? Oh man, she puts us all to shame. She is 12 years old. She, did, she was determined to find a thousand books that have black women featured in them because she knew black girls don't, again, have stories about other black girls or black women. And at age 12, Jordan just said earlier, probably one of the most polished, articulate people I've ever met, regardless of age, and she's still only 12 years old. So she will set the world on fire for sure. Uh, and she has participated in our United State of Women Conference, which again, Lee mentioned, where we had 5,000 women from around the country and the world. And since there are people who are represented, representing other countries here, I want you to know we are still determined to be that beacon of hope. Don't give up on the United States. And that showing that day demonstrated what we can do when we are all working together. And what we have to do is to continue, continue that. And so Jordan is now heading up the United State of Women, which is a separate 501c3. We have a galvanizing effort where we're going around the country. We've already been to Chicago and Columbus. We're going to Atlanta in a couple of weeks on the 18th of September. Really encouraging just what you're doing here. Use your megaphone, convene, uh, organize around issues that you care about. Last night we had a fundraiser for the United States of Women and afterwards several of the young women came over to me and they said, I don't know where to begin. There's so many issues I care about. I'm just finishing college, where do I go? I said, it doesn't matter. Just start on an issue that you care about most. You pick what you feel passionately about. Those of you who are funders, Fund the issues where you think it's going to actually move the needle. I think oftentimes my past history with foundations before I met this incredible group was sometimes they come in and then after three years they move on to the next thing. The effort that we need today is going to be sustained over time. And I know many of you are wondering over the last nine months what in the world is going on here. Our democracy has never been easy. It has never moved in a straight line. I am old enough, older than many of you, to appreciate that there have inevitably been zigs and zags along the way. But what it gives us the power to do is to use our voices, our brains, our hearts. Each of you have the ability to be the next Marley. She may have an edge on you by 10 years or 20 years, but if she could do what she did, if Ashley could do what she did in South Carolina, if Buffy could do what she did here, if Jordan and Kalisha uh, and Arvo could do what they did to help really motivate everyone to get involved in our White House Council on Women and Girls, there are no limits to what you can do. My final piece of advice, though, is you gotta pace yourself. We have a tendency to burn out because we tend to put everybody else first. I see a few of you nodding your heads. I shared with Lee earlier that I remember when my daughter was like three months old, four months old, and I was just going back to work. I was up at two in the morning making baby food from scratch. Why? Why was I doing that? I look back and I think to myself, 
I put so much on myself and I let other people make me feel guilty because I was a working mom. My daughter's second grade teacher said to me during parent-teacher conference, my daughter who's now a correspondent on CNN and went to Harvard Law School, just to brag for a minute, she said to me, crushingly, if you spent less time at work and more time at home, your daughter might do better. <laughs> I'll never forget her, Donna O'Sullivan, yeah, I got you. <laughs> I it's the kind of thing that sticks with you, <laughs> let me tell you. But I, I share this excruciating at the time story just to say to you, you're fine. You're gonna be just fine. Your families are gonna be just fine if you pace yourself and you stay true to your true north. And I know for the first six years of my career, I was busy doing what everybody else thought I should do. I was on a track at a law firm, working ridiculous hours, trying to pretend I wasn't eight months pregnant when obviously I was, <laughs> uh, telling men I was going to the Xerox machine where I was really going for the 15th time to the bathroom. And I was trying to be what I thought people wanted me to be, and I wasn't listening to the quiet voice inside of me. And it's when I began to listen to that quiet voice that I joined local government in Chicago. And it was an incredible adventure. And there are people who say to me, well, you worked in the White House. I learned more working in local government in Chicago to prepare me for my time in the White House than you could possibly imagine. And it was in local government that I recruited this incredible young woman named Michelle Robinson, who is engaged to this guy with a funny name from the south side of Chicago, who did not want her to take the job. And I said, well, when she told me, no, I, you know, I'm not inclined to take it because my fiance thinks it's a bad idea, I said, well, who in the world is your fiance? <laughs> and she told me. And so I said, uh, well, and what can I do to talk you out of it? And she said, well, he suggests we have dinner. And let's talk about it. Could we talk it through together? And I said, yes. And boy, am I glad I said yes <laughs> to that dinner invitation, which means that it is all about relationships. That relationship is now 26 years old. And the relationships that you are forming today around these tables, and I hope you all introduce yourself to people who you do not know and with whom you have never worked before, because that is the fabric that is the strength of society. Being a citizen isn't about just what you do alone, it's what we do collectively. Yes, we have that individual responsibility, of course we do, but you also have a collective responsibility to move that arc of the moral universe and to do it together, I say yes we can. Final point, yes we can may sound familiar to some of you. <laughs> but what you might not remember is that it was created the night that President Obama lost the New Hampshire primary. A primary that everybody, me included, really thought he was going to win. And he didn't even have a concession speech because he was so confident. Losing that primary was probably the best thing that happened to his campaign and to him because it made him realize it's not easy in this country. You're gonna have defeats and you're gonna have setbacks. And it isn't what happens to you, it's what you do about it that counts. And out of that night came the sense that even in the face of a defeat, yes, we can. And so I ask you all, Yes, we can or not? I say, yes, we can. Can we do it? Yes, we can. Can we do it? Yes, we can. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So now I have the honor of introducing the next panel, and this, ironically or coincidentally, the panel is going to discuss how we can strengthen the movement for girls of color. Please join me in welcoming our next panel. Thank you all very much.